Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the last days of Europe. I'm your host, American Mocha Lover. And right now, we have the Quillamane Uprising, as I do see a tiny little bit of support for uh, a certain daddy, Yaki. But anyway, it's the Quillamane Uprising, and as you can see, Africa is a giant mess. After a string of defeats suffered by the numerically inferior Ost-African colonial forces, today, the easternmost African Rex Commissariat and de facto leader of Africa Shield was forced to take an even worse humiliation. As American forces entered Quillamane, the colony's administrative center and the seat of power of Rex Commissar, Mr. Yi Yi Haircut himself, Hans Hutig. The city had been turned into a veritable stronghold, with a ring of bunkers, trenches, minefields, and underground tunnels covering the entire perimeter, and a hellish maze of interlocking firing zones with a garrison couldn't expect to have them, was an enemy from the inside, though it's unknown whether they took contact with the besieging army or if they acted on their own partisan movements all throughout the city's many CCs, those little fun camps that help you concentrate a little bit more, and slave quarters launching a full-scale uprising, slaughtering their jails and breaking free, spreading chaos and panic in the German quarters of the city. This distraction gave the attackers a perfect opportunity to strike, and despite he taking heavy, heavy losses, they managed to dislodge the garrison and fall from the outer bastions and to the urban areas. The last sector to fall was the fortress complex of the Central Administration Compound, which had been riddled with booby traps and death zones. Over 600 soldiers died to take the building from the few dozens of fanatical German SS barricaded there before military engineers and flamethrower teams were sent in. Quillamane was a vital hub for the colony and hosted several industries fundamental to the war effort. The victorious occupants were reportedly shocked by what they saw in the countless mining uh, camps and factorinos, where tens of thousands of desperate men, women, and children lived in abject poverty and starvation. Many were moved to tears and some of the weakest ones died before the very eyes, crying of happiness for being fi free, finally at last. Reichskommissar Hutig managed the fleet of the city flee the city, and is sworn to avenge the defeat with the, the lives of all Americana in the city, but some doubt the factability of such a claim. And yet the war goes on, the Battle of Salisbury. Um, if you'd like to read about the... I read about Quillamane just because that's so important. If you'd like to read about Salisbury, please go right ahead. Um, this, if realistically, with Salisbury, usually it would go back and forth between two groups here, so... But with Quillamane, it's pretty much over by the time we get Quillamane, so... But we shall choose another focus now... There's a lot of support for me to go down two different ways with Wallace here. We could either go the, the full-on gamer immediately path, the fun route with civil rights, or we can be smart and very strategic with how we want to pull our gamer moves. So, what we're going to do first is get back to Hawaii. I'm not even going to bother with saving with Africa. What we want to do is fighting tyranny since 1776, when our great nation declared its independence. It was a statement against the tyranny of fallen masters who trampled the rights of the little man. When our noble forebears conceived and embraced the Monroe Doctrine, it was an assertion of our might, our purpose, and our goal in protecting our whole hemisphere from old world domination in the 40s. Though we failed, as a vilest tyranny imaginable descended upon Eurasia, our complacent elitist le leaders failed to prepare us for the coming storm and then cowardly tried to stay out of the wars until they arrived at their doorstep. Thousands upon thousands of young American men bleeding out in the fields of England for a war that was already lost. Our naval might shattered at Pearl Harbor due to an administration that couldn't see the warnings. Our garrisons and marines murdered, captured, brutalized, and squalid conditions by the Japanese. The foul conspiracy of the Japanese and Germans to drop their doomsday weapon o on Oahu. America has suffered terribly, but our suffering is but a fraction of that of the untold millions laboring under fascist tyranny. Europe may be beyond salvation, but in Asia, we may still have a chance to strike back like avenging angels. Let us explore ways to break the iron grip of the despotic Japanese sphere. So, uh, there is some support for me to go with the Integrationalist. Thank you for the pronunciation guide. Guide. Um, way, which we will eventually do. I'm not sure when, but we will eventually do the integrationalist path. Not sure when, but we will go. And also in the future, like, for future American campaigns, if I want to play as a certain president, we're just going to go ahead and just choose whoever the president is. Like, I will just go ahead and do, like, pretty much all this off-screen just, just to save time, you know. Sometimes we don't want to go four episodes deep and then finally get to who we really want to play as sometimes. Or even six or eight episodes, you know. Just because there's certain, you know, people... Who we want to get and take who we want to get in like 1968. So sometimes it just takes time. Operational success. I'm not sure what we did, but also Operation Huguenot. Bobcat to Eagle's Nest. Very cool. Made contact with journalist Jerome Hedlund. Induced him to print the story author's think tank provided. Immigrant Marcel Marceline Boulevard. 
making waves with the English, taking suitable steps to ensure a false identity remains undiscovered. Story has had effect of inspiring other journalists to seek similar stories, immigrants, family tragedies in print. Major criticism leveled against Enoch, Powell, and Patriots for reticence towards allowing French Protestants into England. Patriot popularity at an all-time low. Jerome Hedlund went off script searching for the real Marceline Boulevard, or Bouvier, against my wishes. Had to take steps to curtail him. Hedlund no longer in the picture. We'll update as the situation evolves. Eagles Nest to Bobcat, a necessary evil. So... Okay, so I'm going to be honest here. I play this a little bit more off screen. Actually, I went back from the last video. And you, we went one way down with, you know, President McCormick before Daddy Wallace was elected. We went one way, which I didn't do before. But actually, I, I went back and changed it. Went back to the other way. Just so we have it slightly more far-right MPP senators. As well as slightly more MPP center senators as well. So slightly less Republican Democrat support. So we have a much more solid South. Not fully solid, but you know, West Virginia and Minnesota and California can all agree upon something. Which is kind of weird to say. But regardless, we're going to finish off this war. And we'll do the best we can. Increase RD unity. I think I also increased um, the NPP unity as well. So, there's stuff here, Wallace and his voter base. Hopefully, I don't, I don't have to do much about this, so... And we have middling support, but the wars down here should... Honestly, wrap up very, very quickly. But we have a few other comments to go through as well, so... Alright. Uh, actually, just... Kind of hold. There you go. Can you kill these guys off? No? Oh, they're already dead. A fest in Victoria? How much more do we have to do for this? Oh, my goodness. Uh, come to Beria, get a festung. Festung is like festival, I think? I can't remember. Celebratory? I, I don't know. Bayeria, Peridorf, all right. Hey, we almost got there at the same time. Nice. All right, where's the next capital? Oh, they're down there. Oh, you're going to hold for now. Just go around them. Literally just do that. All right, so, oh my gosh, look at the mess. This is, I'm sorry for this board gore, man. I am. I apologize slightly for this. Oh, a little bit of lag. Auto saving. So, a uh, couple comments. Someone recommends we support free Indonesia. Yes, my plan is to get directly involved in Indonesia and have a good time. Ease up northern fears. Grows a little more unified. Base will expect more states' rights and segregation legislation in the future. Also, off screen, uh, I have compiled a little list of things I want to do before we go with full gamer mode. So, we'll get there. So, I already have a plan of how to achieve. <clears throat> Glory, as some might say. Oh boy, you want to hold and get out of there. Get out, get out, get out. Nice. Little, follow the wind hook if you like to read about this. Please go right ahead if this happens every single time. So, um, I'm not even sure where the heck you guys are going. So, just go there. Just take everything you can. At this point, just take it all. Okay. Because, honestly, I think this nation... Also, was it also Africa, I think? They just have too many victory points. I would say they have too many victory points. Because I, I, how many times have I got to come down around here again? Like, holy crud, this is ridiculous. But, we're going to go down to the left side here with domestic preparedness. When the National Progressive Party was elected, the American people spoke up with one thunderous voice, tearing down the entrenched elites and embracing a righteous campaign against the Japanese menace wherever it is to be found. At least that's what the party's National Committee chairman claimed at the last convention, in reality. Our victory was a lot narrower than we would have liked, and many of our voters supported us for our progressive domestic agenda, rather than the campaign of vengeance many of the party leadership still like to see as the core of our platform. In addition, many of our former Dixiecrats in the party are openly sympathetic to isolation of stance, and only paid lip service to containing Japan. We now have a difficult choice ahead, promptly reinstating the draft and enact war preparation measures to ensure a nation is protected against the many foreign threats and ready to act swiftly like a pouncing eagle, or to try to, try to gradually build support for these things through a fierce media campaign while optimizing our industry for wartime production. The latter is popular but slow and may leave us unready for a major conflict. The former, of course, the opposite. Go and hold for now. You gotta win there. Fighting tyranny since 1776. You bet your butt we are. Go and kill these guys off. I'm tired of dealing with these guys. And where are you at? You have no organization, but you're still winning. Cool, Washington. No matter your political leanings, all recent conversation in the Capitol invariably turns or to the same subject. President George Wallace's announcement that the U.S. would seek to revise the post-war modus uh, vivendi with the Empire of Japan. The policy of pronouncement, though vague, has been a central policy plank of the National Progressive Party since its formation. Although the administration has largely remained tight-lipped on concrete initiatives, this has only encouraged the imagination of the political class in Washington, members of the NPP congressional delegation. Could be heard throughout the week speculating on America's newfound foreign policy, ranging from doubling military and financial aid to the organization Free Nations, to actively destabilizing the co-prosperity spheres of via many its its many restive insurgencies. While stressing that the ultimate decision rests with the president, senior NPP figures emphasize that all options remain on the table. 
members of the RD party, have expressed skepticism towards the president's confrontational foreign policy, viewing the endeavor as naive adventurism. A senior RD policy aside, who not asked who asked not to be named, pan the NPP policy is dangerously reckless with little consideration for de-escalation. It's all fun and games, are remarked until the nukes fly. At least the NPP fights for America. What do the RD say? They just want to have the same old, same old. That's all they want over there. And we ain't about that. Two sides of literally the same party. Oh, we're getting... Oh, well, nice, nice. Come on, is this it? Please tell me this is it. Knew it. Uh, come on, man. Uh, no, we're going to have a full, absolute 100% victory here, whether we like it or not. Nope. We're going to keep fighting on. I don't care. I don't care what it takes. If I have to kill every single German down here, and boar, so be it. The helicopters are going to do a great job taking them all out. We did it. So ends Hutig's reign of terror. Wait, what? Wait, hold on. Hold on. Nope, nope. Nope. What the heck? Whoa, 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 whoa. Triumph in South Africa. Ah, see, now we got it. Okay. I was a little worried there. I'd have to restart things, but that's okay. It's official. Mer Africa is free. And America is free. The OFN has emerged victorious in the fight against the Africa Shield, crushing the three Nazi Reichskommissars that try to tear down a democratic South Africa apart and expand their fascist ideology all over Africa. Disgusting. President George Daddy Wallace spoke to the nation from the Oval Office to announce the victory and that America's brave boys will return at home as soon as humanly as possible. Even as the first chart of Pan Am flights touched down at airports across the eastern seaboard, crowds of thousands filled terminals and parking lots, waving flags, singing the national anthem, and cheered heartwarming scenes of tired soldiers hugging and kissing their young wives and children snapped by photographers to be shared in newspapers and preserved for eternity. The Secretary of Defense has announced plans to hold a military parade in Washington, D.C. to honor the returned veterans that saved a continent from barbarity and slavery. With the defeat of the Nazis in Africa, now comes a long and tough work to rebuild half a continent for a bright and democratic future. War crime trials will be held to try the captured SS and Wehrmacht soldiers as well as the Boer irregulars. That caused so much death and destruction, new nations will be set up to allow the people of Africa to make their own destiny and fully support it and were built by American money and technical expertise. And of course, millions of people, former slaves, war amputees, orphans, and hungry and sick, will have to be cared for in Africa, as well as our own troops who have seen bloody battles and gruesome deeds that few believe humans are capable of. But, that's a job for tomorrow. Today, we celebrate the victory over Nazism, and that our brave men and women are coming home the Dark Continent no more. We grow a little more unified, discontent with the war will fall by a whole big old bunch. Nice. Now, so, someone wants me here, like, to... Ooh, we can do Rushworth, why not? Um... Like, really focus on helping Africa out. But, involvement, mm, I don't know. I, I really want to do the best I can with George Wallace because we're going to need a lot of support for where we're headed. So, um, no matter the cost, uh, mandates, because it's, it's, it's literally just a sink. It's literally just a massive support sink. Now, I will play as these nations someday. So, we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm pretty much just, I'll be honest, I'm just going to give up on these guys. Ah, Willie Westmoreland. Nice. Hold the East African Summit. So maybe I'll play these guys someday. Not sure when. But for now, yeah, no matter the cost, we're just going to pull out. This is not, this is going to hurt us a little bit, but uh, we just can't afford to have this here. I'm sorry, guys. But... South African war victory. When we took the brave decision to join in in South Africa's defensive war against German aggressors, there were many who claimed that we had entered a pointless war, one where true victory was impossible due to the circumstances of the situation. Yet, when the final rocks come to surrendered and their leaders were taken into custody, none could deny the fact that we had achieved overwhelming victory against the forces of tyranny during the war. We discovered the deplorable conditions of the natives and peoples of Africa were kept in by the German oppressors, disease and famine were common, and by the regimes cared little for the people beyond how much wealth could be extracted before they ran dry. This has to change. Our South African allies have taken administrative control over Namibia, Rhodesia, and southern Mozambique. That leaves a vast swath of land in Central Africa under our control. Keeping the land would be a ridiculous and idiotic idea. However, we must choose whether to establish multiple democratic states in the area or attempt to create a single, unified Central African state, which I think sounds amazing. I would love to have one massive state, but keep them separated for now. Uh, you know what? I don't know when the next TNO update is. I'm thinking about saving the game just so that we can come back to this and just play all three nations, but the establishment of African mandates. The weeks after the victory in Africa had been hectic, to say the least. With Africa's shield units laying down their arms in mass, OFN military units had found themselves advancing far past the scope of their orders and seizing hundreds of square miles of territory in days. The OFN command in South Africa had scrambled to transition from combat duties to civil, civilian affairs. 
Armored flamethrower vehicles were quickly re-engineered as water carriers to rural villages. Huey helicopters ferried emergency rations to the few seas of the interior, cut off from Germany, German resupply. Battalion signals companies found themselves operating as impromptu administrative centers, coordinating armed patrols and mis medical missions alike. All the while, the politicians deliberated on the future of the newly liberated African continent. A month after the end of the war, OFN leaders announced that the former German Reichskommissariat would be replaced by three OFN mandates, granted executive powers to manage to secure the former Reichskommissariat until they could stand on their own two feet. Two weeks later, an American major watched a detachment of helicopters touch down in Cape Town, carrying the first wave of civilian administrators for the continent, and new orders. The officer corps of the South African War were still needed. The work of the mandates meant that he'd be serving in Africa for a few years yet. The only question was whether he'd be in the field or if he called home to serve as a liaison to the OFN High Command. Co oh. Oh, okay. Quillamane in East Africa. We could actually play them if we really wanted to, so. Duty calls from Washington, D.C. So, we'll see someday. We'll play some. Because I don't know how many people actually play these guys. Oh, wait. Oh, Borman is still there. Okay. Well, he's one now. Central European Council. Oh, and they got to flip back. So, cool. For this Stuka. The Stuka. The mandate expires. Following their successful intervention in the South African War, the OFN found themselves occupying large swaths of the continent. There was great hopes for the mandates set up to administer the territory. They would empower the natives and prove the superiority of democratic governance. Sound, tested models of administration and investment would unlock the economic potential of Africa. The Indian and South Atlantic Oceans would be secured for the free world. Like many foreign conquerors before them, they soon found their ambitions dashed. Their leadership found itself overwhelmed trying to make sense of the desperate tribes, factions, and groupings that struggled to maintain just the status quo. Investments dried up as delays, red tape, and petty corruption made a mockery of investment models and profit projects. Generals and politicians alike watched with horror as patrol after patrol failed to make it back to their bases. The cumulative, cumulative, cumulative weight of all these setbacks had proven too much for the bear to, for the mandates and their masters, and are now cutting their losses and leaving the territories. What now for Africa? A whole lot of collapse. I see you play South Africa someday too. But my focus is on America. You, me, and America. What could be better than that? Cutting down the debt. Oh, we actually got that one done. Nice. Other than that, I think that's it for the research, isn't it? Oh, never mind. I lied. I didn't know I lied, so. And did Africa fall apart already? It does. Salazar wants colonies returned. Following our victorious conclusion of the South African War. One cannot neglect to mention the support of the Iberia within the conflict. Their sizable contributions significantly aided in creating the conditions of victory over the Boers and the German sphere. The Iberians themselves are very well or very aware of this fact, and thus are and are thus attempting to leverage it to the best advantage. Recently, a letter signed from the Caudillo Salazar, the Portuguese co-dictator of Iberia, arrived for the president, probably president. The nature of the letter, if one could get around the complexities of diplomatic writing, was a candid request. Salazar expresses to us that following the significant Iberian contributions in South Africa, Iberia formally requested the U.S. that Iberia be allowed to reoccupy her former Portuguese colonies seized by the Germans in prior decades, whilst we understand the Iberian desire to reclaim her former territories following a hard-fought conflict. It would be near impossible to retain a positive moral image should we accept. Our public image was one of fighting for freedom and against German imperialism and aggression in the region. Should we allow Iberia her spoils of war it would merely appear as a replacing one colonial dictatorship with another? The Iberians would not be pleased to be denied, however. For our own sake, we have but one choice. We appreciate the help, but... Nah, we good. So we could probably close this. We don't need to see this. Uh, we don't need to see that either. Cool. 14 billion. We, we're still building some civvies. The often gives East Africa's independence, complete independence, freedom at last. Just don't ask about what's going to happen down here in all parts of the United States. Something called... Something with crows and jimmies and... Oh boy, this is going to be wild. Oh, but hold on. Do we still have Angola? No, we don't. Oh, I thought they'd be in the OFN. Because we helped them out. There we go, my friends. Our boys are home. And next up, what we're going to do is this. Hello, where'd he go? Oh, we went over here on the right side instead of down here. Oh, because the South... The Save the Africa thing was happening. So, feed the beast. War needs men. It consumes them with great greed and hunger for more. It is a sad reality of conflict. It is, it is likely that in any prolonged conflict that we would be forced to instate the draft anyway, and if we are to realize the new American dream of freeing the world from tyranny, at least from the, from the Japanese tyranny, conflict is inevitable. All Americans will have to take part in making this dream a reality, and dancing around it only puts our precious liberty and our aspirations further at risk. The draft must be reinstated better now, while we are at relative peace so that people get used to it, than when our country is already bleeding and struggling in war. Let us set up a task force with the Pentagon and Census Department to determine our drafting capabilities and begin contracting factories to produce kits for a greatly expanded military machine. With some luck, a bit of domestic discontent now will mean a quick and relatively painless war in the future, as a superior numbers and technological 
uh, advantages overwhelm our foes with shock and awe. Better protests, better protests that now than draft riots while the Japanese are still shelling the Golden Gate. Fire up the people would be not bad, actually, but operation success. Bushworth, boys are coming home to Oh my goodness. Bobcat Eagle's Nest, funds allocated by the Treasury, been successfully deployed in campaign to bolster the most democratic elements of the British NDL party. Campaign to stick in form with the clean water, clean streets, clean uh, government vote NDL. Um, I think actually I've read this one before. So if you'd like to read this one again, Rushworth. So, like I said, I did replay this a little bit, so. The boys are coming home, as the address from the White House sends. So, too, does the first major conflict between the U.S. and a major power for the first time in nearly two decades. The housewife of a military man, having heard that her husband will, indeed, be coming home, screeches in delight as her neighbor, having only received her flag for a decease the day before, stares at the TV in a broken tor torpor. Oh, boy, that feels bad. College students put aside their protest placards and megaphones for the day, choosing instead the bottle and a blunt for a day, basking in the fruit of their success, or the unstated delight that they will not be called up anytime soon. The draftees in boot camp continue to curse their fate and their drill sergeants, but a tad quieter, relieved that their service might be a peaceful one. In the Pentagon, planners quietly vacate their desks for a longer than usual smoke break, and their immediate work mercifully concluded. Concluded, that is, until the inevitable orders come to prepare for the soldiers' return. And in the White House, the President receives another briefing, their thoughts unknowable, beneath a facade of practice calm. Across America. The nation welcomes the first day after the South African War tomorrow. America will greet the dead and embrace its returning heroes, and start coming to terms with the horrors of the war in the belt and its consequences. Another generation defined by war domestic preparedness. The devil of policy formulation was in the details. As the cabinet drafted the outline of America's industrial strategy to support any future war with Japan, two distinct schools of thought that had emerged. One championed by Secretary of Defense advocates for the expansion of military infrastructure and production cap capacity. The legacy of the President J uh, Joseph Kennedy's failure to build up America's military continues to haunt the pre Pentagon. Proponents of this plan argue that a build up of military equipment needed to support a future war must start today, even at the expense of other industrial or economic priorities. They warn that ultimately America will go to war with the military it has rather than the military it wants. A Secretary of Commerce take, take, takes a different tack, arguing that fostering the growth of America's civilian industrial base would yield accelerating dividends in the long run, the wholesale diverse, diversion of American industry into a military production, they argue, would be a monstrously inefficient and create a hyper-militarized economy like that of Germany or Japan, a nation of free men enslaved to the guns. Even if it would take time to shift civilian factories to military production in a crisis, America remains protected by the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, buying time to bring American industry to bear. Uh, I like, I, I, I know I chose this one last time when I had this, but I like that one much more. Fire up the people would not be bad. Community action. We fight for America. Lower destabilizing pacifism, huh? Recruitment outreach, bill, send a bill through Congress. I like Rosie the radio operator. Fun the skunk works. Oh, wait, maybe we wanted to do that one. Uh, I, think was, I think I'm going to go to the left side, though. Yeah. So after this one, eyes on the port. Oh, nice. Let's cut it down. Cut it down. Not bad. Oh, got some air uh, doctrine done, too. Cool. Yeah, I'm glad our boys are home. That, that's a, that was not super easy. I said it would be super easy if someone remarked in a... Uh, Oh, one of the episodes I did earlier. Or my Discord server, so. It's all good, though. We've won, and that's what matters. Operation Hanky? Nice. I'm just clicking on buttons, too, so. Alright, next focus, shall we? Feed the beast. Eyes on the port. I wanted to do this stuff when we can do other stuff, so. Uh, let's do pump the gas. Our military industry is performing insufficiently. The Japanese can draw upon the industrial strength and resources of an entire continent, and the full force of American industrial might must be put to use against them. While our preparations for the draft ensured an uptake in infantry equipment production, we soon need to beat the Japs in the air and on the sea, not to mention ensure our brave GIs have the support they need of tanks, artillery, and vehicles. Over the last few weeks, a number of politicians and generals have approached our administration with, with ideas of a vast aid package for the military industrial complex, with the government funding the construction of new arms plants in return for increased control over production. While they are probably paid off, off with promises of cushy board positions in their retirement from office, that doesn't mean that they are wrong. Let us draw upon a bill to support our proud American weapons com companies bringing prosperity to our lands and putting weapons in our hands. Actually, maybe I should have turned on the right side, but what? it doesn't matter. As long as we can negotiate with the Japanese, that's the most important thing in my mind. We have to negotiate with them to bring home the Pacific Islands. National Guard Divisions? Not bad, not bad. Um, actually, what are we using it? Tell me it's a National Guard division, right? Okay, that's good. Oh, it's just Cuba. It's just Guantanamo Bay. Who cares? Cool. We got enough stuff here. We need more helicopters, which we're going to send straight to Indonesia when the thing comes. 
Operation Hanky, Bob Gat, the Eagle's Nest, successfully made contact with several elements of the British populace antithetical to St. John Stevens and NDL Whigs in accordance with operations directives, placed several assets in foreign office uh, civil service. Assets are proceeding to generate falsified documents to weaken support for Whigs. Where possible, bribes will be employed to sway members of parliament and turn ancillary group or government personnel agents against Whigs. If necessary, certain players will be blackmailed to change their stance in the House. Operation proceedings exactly as planned. Eagles, Nuts, and Bobcat, understood? Good work. Sabotage German politics? Oh, you bet we're going to sabotage them. Nice. Best of luck to them. Oh, boy, that's not good for those peoples. But, hey, McInt Oh, no, hold on. I, I got criticized because I kept saying this name wrong when I played as Scotland. And, and rightfully so. I was... Not saying this is quite correct. Ooh, do we want to spend any more money on construction stuff? And oh, we're doing so well. You know what? We're going to slash it. Wow, well, that's in a billion then. Even though we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, okay, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 20. Okay, I think that's enough. Let's, let's cut that down. If we do that and cut it all, all the way to the bottom, we still have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Hold on. Give it a day. Okay, never mind. We have one, two, three-ish. Which is actually okay. I like cutting down the debt, so look at that. McIntyre. Uh, that's a correct, I think, way to say it. Makes state visit to Washington. Pennsylvania Avenue is lined with the stars and stripes in St. Andrew's Cross this week as the Scottish President Robert McIntyre and his wife Letitia arrived on an official state visit, greeted by the U.S. Chief of Protocol at Andrews Air Force Base. The couple has been staying in their Blair House, the official presidential guest house, for the duration of the visit. In a ceremony held on the White House lawn, the President welcomed President McIntyre to Washington, remarking that it is the first visit by the leader of Scotland in the history of the country. McIntyre thanked the, the President of the United States, hoping that this visit would lead to better relations with America after a complicated and somewhat strange start. McIntyre was then taken to the State Department building for a luncheon hosted by the Vice President. Who is our Vice President, actually? That now was a seat dinner, a white tie event held in the state dining room of the White House. Both leaders were in attendance, as well as many notable guests. Frank Sinatra hosted a short half-hour performance afterwards in the East Room as well. McIntyre will make a speech at his joint meeting of Congress today, as well as, a, as a visit the tomb of the unknown soldier and host a return dinner in the Scottish Embassy. He is expected to stay longer than the traditional four days in order to visit historical locations across the East Coast, such as Mount Vernon, which I've been to, which is really nice, Monticello, and Independence Hall. In remarks to the press, McIntyre expressed... Uh, enjoyment with this trip so far and feels the bonds between America and Scotland have been strengthened. We hope this makes us the best friends with the Scots. We love the Scots. So, Curtis will make... Oh, he's a... Oh, he's a VP. Okay. A flamboyant tough dude. All oh, right. Let's go pump that gas. Oh, yeah. Mm, pump that gas. Pump, 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 pump. Rush militarization? Eh, that costs us more. Be the center for the far right. Extreme hangovers. Yes. We must be united at taking these guys out. See, reason? Eh. We don't need to rush things. We're doing okay as is. Awesome. I can't wait to start cutting down to the death. Born in the USA. It seems as soon as a do boat docked at Norfolk, uh, I almost said Japan, Virginia, port that jo so Jonathan Stafford, soldier of the 134th Jayhawk Plains Division, would finally find peace after years of turmoil in the South African War. He was born to a poor farming couple in the central Kansas region and learned to drive a tractor when he was only seven years old. His skill with the rifle came when he crossed the border into Arkansas and began hunting wild hogs to feed his mother and father. When he turned 18, he was faced with a dilemma. Either join the army, provide parents a substantial income, or stay on the farm for eternity. Once the recruiters arrived at the farm, Jonathan's parents would not see their son again for another six whole years. Training came and went, and before he knew it, Jonathan's division was sent off to Port Elizabeth. The Jayhawk division, organized in Kansas, was well prepared for the lowly plains of South Africa, but mastering the train was only one step in the process of combat. Stafford himself was involved in several offenses against the Germans and pulled together several kills, but his involvement ended when he shot, was shot in the shoulder. While he was being taken to cover, an advancing German shot another two bullets into his wrist and hand. Those wounds were not fatal, and Stafford fully recovered, but much to his chagrin, he was sent back home. Now, Stafford... Stafford was a very proud American. He hoped the general public would hail him as a hero who fought for his country. To put it bluntly, he received the exact opposite. Protests spat on him. Threw dirt in his face and he would try to frame him for murder. Students from Kansas State found his address intended to get it, set his parents' farm ablaze. But police arrested them before they could act. The public response to Stafford's actions was probably even more scarring than his ex experience in the war. He only did what he was told. Oh. I, I think I said this last time when this happened. This doesn't make any sense. Or at least it makes some sense, but we literally won. We literally got rid of all of the... Well, at least most of the Nazi influence in Africa. So I don't understand why that would be as much. Sure, you're still going to have some uh, anti-war protesters and maybe even rioters to a degree. But to have that happen, if you win the war, it should be a little bit, you know, a little bit more mixed. I'm not saying it should be too much on one side, but 
He only did was 12. And he says he was from Kansas? That doesn't touch Arkansas. It touches Missouri. But, I mean, it's really close, but... I don't, I've never actually... I've never been to Kansas. I've been to Arkansas once. It, so, some parts of Arkansas is really, really nice. Other parts, not so much. Hey, but hey, whatever. Uh, disrupt the Borman regime with seem, seem fine. Rimpon, Homestead, Rupert. Let's do Rupert. Nice. 99% chance. If we fail... Well, then oh well. Ah, oh, good. Start cutting down on that debt. You know what? We can spend more once we have uh, the debt done, so... Uh, what do we have over here? Russian militarization. Uh, democracy returns. Italy? Great. CIA operatives? Nice. And Africa? This, not Africa. Uh, Russia. I couldn't think of that R word. It's killing itself. Well, we don't have enough. Well, actually, we do have enough expertise. I think we already have everything here. Too bad you can't get higher levels of this stuff. That'd be really cool. Just so you can keep working on stuff. So, Operation Success. Well done, gentlemen. Bobcat to Eagle's Nest. Operation Rupert. Have made contact with General Redacted and showed incriminating photos to him during the post-war War conference. Applied pressure in the form of threats to release the compromising material. Redacted submitted and declared he would make every effort to align military goals with the British civilian government. So far, Redacted and officers directly answerable to him have made good this promise. Military aiding and reconstruction efforts. Noticeable reduction of infighting between civilian bureaucrats and military liaison officers. Allocation of manpower to groundbreaking projects proposed by the government. Infrastructure projects are proceeding satisfactorily. As of now, no declassification of military documents has occurred. We'll be meeting with General Redacted again if this has not changed within one month's time. Overall appraisal of Operation Successful, Eagles Nest of Bobcat, bravo! Operation Homestead, nice. And Stabilize Iberia, because they're, they're going to need some stabilization. I played as Iberia before, and I might do it again just for a little short campaign, just for fun. But it's, it's been a long time since I've actually done it, so... And there's so many nations. Like, I, like there's three mandates here you can play as independently. As well as the other mandate, like the big old democratic mandate you can't play as well, but cogs in the machine. The government has extensive powers over private industries in the case of national emergencies. With a bit of creativity or creative interpretation of these laws, we can encourage the heavy industries to optimize the production lines for our potential wartime needs like a scout. And Americans should always be prepared. Amen. Focus on fuel? We got enough fuel for now. Military construction speed, mass producing equipment. Focus research in the air. Uh, civilian factory construction speed. We're already doing pretty darn well. That's not bad either. Yeah, this stuff is okay. Oh, actually, infrastructure. Um, hmm. People are unhappy with what we did. Segregation. I say tried. So, ease northern fears. I don't want to do any more of that stuff though. Go further divided. Go a little more united. More states' rights and segregation. Well, I think we might just focus on land just because we can. Get more research for land doctrine, which I think we're done with. Motorization, weapons and equipment. I think this one is actually worth taking, just because we're not going to spend that much political power here as, as much as we possibly can afford to. So, we, only get, we don't get that much either. We get 0.44 a day, so. After this one, Rosie the radio operator. Nice. We're facing down one of the world's largest empires. The Japanese control over a billion people in their sphere, and they, one can field a massive army were war to break out. Though we are a large nation in our own right, we struggle to find enough manpower to meet our defensive needs. Perhaps it's time to think outside the box and consider if women are really biologically unable to drive trucks and operate radios. President Wallace will introduce the Women's Occupational Military Equality Normalization Act in Congress. This act will open up support roles to women for the first time in history. While some would see this as an erosion of traditional gender roles, this bowl has... Bill has the potential to unite war hawks and progressives to create a grander, more egalitarian fighting force. Oh boy, inconceivable class of underground state unity. Oh boy. Oh boy, boy, boy. We can spend more, but now we ain't about spending more right now. Alright, so 12 to 32. The far right wants to put women in the, into jobs. Now that's progress. Oh, we can talk to the Republicans. Let's see. So we have all... Oh, and the center. We, the center and the far right, we love women. They wanted to go work and just pay taxes and not focus on anything but jobs. Amen. So 43, we have enough already. I don't want to spend political power. So 12 plus 11 is usually 23, if I remember correctly. 23 plus 32 is sometimes over 50. 23 plus... Yeah. Yeah, I, I swear to God. As I get older, I can't do operations as much as well. Well, like pronouncing words. Pronouncing pronouncing words speaking oh my god what's right happened to me i'm a boomer oh god no nice actually these divisions we, oh, oh actually don't we lose army xp i think when i played as rfk we lost army xp every single day or something like that so is this only 12 combat width we're gonna need a little more than that now it's not ideal but hey it is what it is have everyone train if they need to train so that's just for the best. And I was actually told maybe I should convert these guys over to um, actual helicopter division. So actually, I might just do that. I love the Marines and all, but screw it. We're going to do it. 
really emphasize them. Nice. Oh, do you have more ships? Stand up for America, stand up for women. We love women here. Oh, I forgot about this whole naval stuff, too. Oh, God, no. Wow, look at that. 366 ships. All right. After securing its passage in the Senate through a bipartisan coalition, President Wallace signed the Women's Occupational Military Equality Normalization Act to a resounding applause. Act bars armed forces from discriminating against potential recruits on the basis of sex. This grants women the legal right to serve in all non combatant military occupations. Upon signing the act, Wallace remarked, For centuries, women have played a pivotal part in building this great nation. They worked in the farms and the factories. They raised the young and cared for the old. Despite all that, they never had the opportunity to play in their part in defending our republic from external threats, which is nothing but absurd when you consider what our brave women do and have done for this country. Today, this great injustice will end. I'm proud to sign the Women Act, and I look forward to the day where both men and women serve in our terrific army. Cheers to the fighting girls. We get more recruitable population factory with a little bit more support stability. And RDs look a little better in southern states, but the NPP grows a little bit more unified. Why? Do we love it, but we gotta fund them skunk works. During the last war, the Skunk Works project was nicknamed of Lock Lockheed Martin's P-80 fighter development program due to the foul smell of the workshop. Since Skunk Works has come to refer to any secret or semi-secret project developed by a private company that is unbound by the normal organizational budgetary restrictions of the company. If we create a special grant for businesses who organize Skunk Works, we can encourage more corporations to do secret projects for us and create a more decentralized military research model that will be harder for the Japanese spies or German ones for that matter to sabotage, steal, or invest us. Too much of a personal touch. Campaign fundraising meetings outside election years were laborious and mind-numbing affairs at best with Wallace hoarding a stack of dele uh, delegated reports and unread briefing papers in a dusty corner of the Oval Office. The fact that Wallace was attending today's meeting and paying attention underscored the shared concurrent of alarm and panic facing the MPP's electoral strategists. <clears throat> Mr. President, the trend is undeniable. We've seen a sharp drop off in high wealth, Fortune 500 level ind individual donors, and flat or reduced contributions for the major corporate political action committees. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce flat out refuses to meet with us. Wallace is indignant. Why the heck are these businesses giving us a cold shoulder? The strategy has shifted uncomfortably, but pressed on. In short, Mr. President, it's you, and your focus on states' rights and civil rights. Wallace hackles Rose. The nerve of this little man telling him what to do. Hurley, the leader of the congressional NPP delegation, butted in, we're not going to get in your way of a, pro of a project near and dear to you, but for the love of God, mate, you got to let somebody else be the face of economic policy. Otherwise, we're going to lose the funding the war, and with it, control of the agenda. Money talks and voters and votes with his feet. <clears throat> Excuse me, senors, but uh, what about civil rights? We're trying to get Hawaii back. America is strong together. And yeah, they're unhappy right now, but still, it doesn't make any sense. Why? Like, what are they talking about? We're here trying to get Hawaii back. Bat ready for the battle, though. We've done everything we can to prepare for the nation for the Japanese hordes. Our factories are roaring with production, spitting out an endless stream of supplies. Millions of men and tens of thousands of women fill our ranks. The dock guards are working overtime to produce warships, and our storage tanks are filled with millions of gallons of fuel. The establishment press may whine, and you may see the odd student protest, but the important thing is that our nation has been forged in a steel fist with which to smash the co -prost. Spared a sphere. The Emperor must be shaken in his kimono. And the capital of his evil empire, let us immediately review our plans to take back what is rightfully ours and where to go from there. Cool. Operational success. Right now, we're trying to help out uh, Iberia, really. Operation Homestead. Uh, we could do the English American Relations. We could try that. I, I want to help contribute to the AAS and stabilize Iberia, but, mm, you know, I'll step up this one again. Why not? Cool. It's not like we can research anything else, so it's all right with me. And actually, instead, I actually raise the construction spending a little bit more just because I want to produce a little bit more. I found in uh, New York and Rhode Island, Washington, we could spend a little bit more time on there, and I really want to get all these roads done. Once roads are done, though, then I'm going to really cut stuff, to, stuff back down. Noble Sabias, Unified Central. Oh, wow. Well, I know I want a lot of radar, too, apparently, too. Actually, you get in a special event if you put enough nuclear reactors here, but we don't have enough space, so it is what it is. Eyes on the port. If we're ever to eliminate the shameful stain on American sovereignty caused by the RDs, the so-called treaty ports, we will need to decipher the Japanese codes. While we have a good overview of the layout of the ports and garrisons due to them being in the middle of our cities, the Japanese will surely try to reinforce them with Navy and Army elements once they figure out what we're planning. At that point, it'll be crucial that our Navy elements can position themselves to intercept any Japanese aid force and dissuade them from trying to stage relief landings or shelling the cities. Let's put our own powerful computers to work cracking the ciphers. It surely won't take too long. How good could Japanese-produced electronics be anyway? Well, that could be fairly decent, so 
Let's go ahead and go with this. Nice. Beautiful. Minus 28 billion every year is still not bad. So, all eyes on the ports. Up next, uh, invest in Novosibirsk. Oh, yeah. Nice. Maybe we want to help them out a little bit. Yeah, we'll try that. Why not? Nice. Very good. <clears throat> all eyes on the ports. And then Port Alcatraz. The port garrison themselves <clears throat> should be a little more than slight speed bumps for our tanks, but our generals are worried about the Japanese Navy elements present in the many of the ports. With the ports so close to important civilian, residential, and financial areas, an open naval battle in the harbors of, God forbid, open shelling in the cities will be disastrous. Let us install heavy naval air artillery on islands and shorelines surrounding the ports with minimal effort to hide it from the Japanese. With some luck, they'll be too frightened to leave port when the fighting starts. And even if they do try to run the gauntlet, we will neuter neutralize them before they can get close to a good firing position. Saturday mornings with Tom and Jerry. And one surprise surprise release. <clears throat> MGM, or Golden or Go Metro Goldwyn Meyer, announced to millions of eager American children that their most famous cat and mouse duo has come to CBS. A press release from the broadcasting channel itself said that new episodes of the award-winning cartoon show Tom and Jerry will feature in its weekend morning lineup along with reruns of the shorts made by Gene Deitch and original creators Hannah, Bar Hannah Bar Bar Barbara. <clears throat> The series has undergone numerous challenges in both art style and content since their introduction to the viewing public in 1940, but MGM has promised to maintain the consistently high quality of comedy it is known for, with the venerable Chuck Jones of Warner Brothers cartoons fame in charge of the reboot. Observers believe the Big Five studio has every reason to be confident in their claims. Regardless of the details, fans both young and old have since expressed their act Ah, ecstasy, and seen the duo slapstick escapades every morning, Saturday morning with bags of heartfelt mail delivered to MGM's post office box. The future seems bright for a centerpiece of an entire generation's childhoods, and it may just remain such for another for as long as it continues to run. Perfection to views on the little, little screen. Yeah, another CIA operative. Cool. We haven't lost one of those guys in a while. Maybe it's time to lose one of them. Invest in Novosibirsk? Why not? Cool. Focus on ocean. Civilian factory, air, fuel. Russian military. Rally the extremists. Oh, that's kind of cool. Grows a little more unified and consolidate more into our wing. Rally the far right. I love the far right. I love what the, the uh, center, right? Oh, let's cut this one too. Cool. Rally the center. <clears throat> well, what do you mean by extremist? MPP will consolidate, grow more unified and consolidate. Uh, exactly the same thing. So let's rally the center. No, let's do the far right first. Can we rally the extremists? Contribute to these guys? That'd be really good. I want to see Iberia do okay. Um, did something else happen? Oh, Nova Sabir, so it's fine. Yeah. We can really help them out. Uh, cool. Rally the center. And, you know, I'll do one more. Rally the extremists. So now, yeah. If they're working together well, that's, is that it? 52 Republican Democrats and 46 National Progressives. Um, that's kind of disappointing. I guess, does this really do anything here then? Because we we're trying to rally each other and we didn't get any more influence or anything like that. And can I just infinitely, like, support these guys? That'd be kind of cool. But anyways, yeah, it looks like we can. So I'm never going to do that again then. <clears throat> Battleship diplomacy. Any battle with Japan, whether it be guns blazing or the threat of said guns, will be decided by our naval capability. We need an overwhelming force to threaten the scum out of their brutalized domains on American soil from Honolulu to Attu Island. We need more dockyards, better dockyards, faster dockyards. Show the Japanese the unrivaled power of thousands of tons of American steel. Laine takes over Britain government and bloody towns for Brittany. Oh boy. Have a good time, guys. Just don't kill too many of your own soldiers off or you people, really. <clears throat> soldiers, I guess, are expendable. Just some civilians, not so much. Stabilize them. Because we can't. I mean, I'm just throwing money at these guys. I'm not sure if it's going to help us at all. Unhappy, unhappy. Offers from Rome. In recent months following Italian democratization, and actually the DC one, I believe. Let's see. We've been approached by the Italian diplomatic envoys with overtures of friendship and cooperation. While we've spent years courting the Italians since the break with the Nazis, this latest development represents a golden opportunity to bring the Italian Empire firmly into our sphere. Pietro Nenni, hello. With control over the Suez, dominance over the Mediterranean, and a colonial empire that stretches from Tunis to the Horn, Italy would make a valuable addition to the free world, and, effects, and the effects of gaining an ally right on the doorstep of the Reich cannot be overstated. Every available effort should be made to bring the Italians into the OFN, lest this opportunity slips from our grasp, or worse, fall into the hands of our enemies. Get me the ambassador? Nice. Libertarian... Oh, he actually went... Oh, holy crap. They went Libertarian Socialist. Now, I definitely didn't go, didn't go down this way when I played Italy, but holy crud. Whoa, this is... That's kind of cool. Kind of cool. 
All right, anything, the CIA is still here. Um, contribute to the AAS, probably. Cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm really surprised that these are not working together more. Like, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. And actually, America, how are we doing, is still disunited, which is not good. Hmm. Once we get back to Hawaii, though, we'll be okay. News from Tokyo. <clears throat> While we begin efforts to move the Italians into our lines, we have recently received information that the Japanese Empire is doing much the same. Hoping to bring the Italians into the co-prosperity sphere, this cannot be allowed to pass. Italian entry into the CPS would be a major boon to the Japanese, granting them a foothold in Europe and transforming the sphere into a truly global bloc. Such a result would be unacceptable. Every available resource must be used to bring the Italians into the OFN, or at the very least, to prevent the Japanese from bringing them into the sphere. We cannot let Tokyo get a leg up over us in the Cold War. Absolutely. All right. Anything else here yet? Nope. And maybe we'll stabilize our barrier after this. So anything about it Italy? I don't see anything here about Italy, though. Black market trading? I guess we could... Eh, I don't want to spend any more political power. <clears throat> Battleship diplomacy? Very cool. It's not an election year, so that's very good for us. Uh, see y'all here all. Our computers and cryptographers have done it at last. We have now a complete understanding of how many and what Japanese troops move in and out of their <clears throat> our ports and where they are stationed. We also get advance warning of any sudden Japanese naval reinforcements. We are as ready as we can get once we redeploy our troops after these plans. Nice. You know, while we're doing this, I'm investing so much, they're probably just going to collapse anyways. People are just so unhappy. Belize votes for the Kingdom of England to join the OFN. Uh, excellent. Excellent. New Zealand, Guyana, Australia, Canada. Oh, a fan expansion. Support, 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 support. Admit them? No. <laughs> Just no. Tokyo Sour and the Japanese and the puppets in the sphere have made several overtures towards the Italians to woo them into their alliance, including offers of the technology. Favorable access to key resources. We need to take more action to bring Rome to our side, or at the very least prevent those darn Japs from bringing them into their sphere. Where's the ambassador? Do we have anything we can do to help them out? I am open up everything here. There's nothing here. Do we have to go over here or something? No? I mean... Are we are we literally forced to... Like, have them join the Japanese when we play as America or something? I don't, I don't see any sort of uh, decision. Let's close that out. No, fighting black market trading. We could do that, but... Diplomatic Arena. I'm not seeing anything here. I mean, there's our senators, so... We can close that one out, too. Play up our achievements? No. Um, so... Is there anything we can do about this? Can I invest? How can I invest in Italy? Do it? Do we just have to hover over them and make like a, a decision on the world map that way? I don't see anything. So, I guess on to Tokyo. Why not? Oh, death of Supreme Court Justice. If you'd like to read about this one, please go ahead. This is exactly the same thing we had earlier. And he was a conservative, so... Let's fill this vacancy. The Japanese may be imperialists, but brutal devils have gripped Hawaii and our west coast ports in the closet some 20 odd years later. But we will still give them a chance at negotiating before we wipe the floor with them. Their intercontinental ballistic missiles are in range of most American states, and many of the Pentagon and White House are worried that should the conflict escalate into a nuclear exchange, it would prove costly. Even if the Japanese missiles are inferior copies of America's, and to a lesser extent Germany's, quality designs, and some of them might actually hit close to their targets, and with atomic weapons, accuracy is not a biggest concern. A peaceful withdrawal of the Japanese garrisons would soon the righteous wrath for a little while anyway nice okay so now oh, okay finally we got to invest oh crap we have to spend save our pp then oh crap then we got to invest more in here then so we can get more daily pickle power oh peace conference was there a peace conference between somebody uh we didn't already spend diplomats we'll gain less than four points in the next issue when selected we gain one more point po oh the popularity decreases a little bit oh that's not good Counterintelligence reports, a Federal Bureau of Investigation and Counterintelligence Division. Memorandum subject to surveillance of the ports of San Francisco and L.A. Director, installation of all requisitioned surveillance and monitoring equipment has been completed. The FBI field offices in San Fran and L.A. are now capable of conducting all around the clock surveillance of an activity surrounding and within the Japanese concessions, including but not limited to the following. Visual surveillance of all entry and exit traffic, expanded informant network inside concessions, cross-referencing of all Japanese staff with known Kenpai Tai alliances or aliases, real-time interception of all electronic communications, maritime monitoring posts to track all shipborne uh, deliveries on-site cryptographic analysis of intercepted message traffic, 
Magnetic weight surveillance devices under U.S. checkpoints to intercept illicit or sensitive materials and personnel. Further technical details are available in Appendix B. Initial operating results and analysis is the primary subject of mem memorandum. We see all. So we have three points right now. Uh, this is a beautiful thing. So really, I don't know why they would go with, like, Italy, oh, not Italy, but Japan. Like, it makes no sense why they go with Japan, especially if they're return socialists. We can go with, uh, let's go with the medium investment. Nice. I don't want to hurt our, uh, you know, stuff. Oh, hello, Indonesian war. Here we go. Nice. Yeah, let's finish off our air doctrine. Nice. I love free Indonesia. Oh, volunteerinos. We can only send one dude. Well, that sucks. Um, you guys are still land. You are really lacking the one hundred and first. All right. We'll send over out of supply expert marine. Who is this guy? Um, Charles Bone Steel, level six attack. That's really, 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 really good. Holy crap! I think that's him, right? Yes, I'm good. Very nice. All right. Let's see. What do we want? MPP's popularity decreases by a bit. Increases our influence. So independence, international leaning. Decreases Italian independence. Okay, interesting. Decreases Japanese influence. So this will go more like this direction, where my mouse is going up, it, right around here. Um, getting one more point. Invest in diplomats for Italy. No. What's that one? Oh wait, we can. Oh crap, that's a lot more political power that we need. Oh yeah, this is not good. Well, let's see what happens because we'll invest more diplomats anyways. Oh, and what is this one? Issue negotiations, Japanese proposal. Huh. There you go. We want to get more max investment next, so. All right, so when can we do this again? Uh, we got to just boost it up here. And send some air volunteers. How many can we send? Oh, that's Japanese. Uh, 240, that's not bad, actually. Uh, planes? Where do we have planes here? It's not bad. Cool. And that should guarantee us uh, some real good stats there. Good, 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 good. Oh yeah, we. How do we only make that many helicopters with that many factories on them? All right, maximize the factories. Take everything else off. Leave everything else at one. Motorize is not bad. Yeah, other than that, yeah, that's, that doesn't make any sense. It, it makes it takes so much to produce some. Holy crud! All right, boost it up. Cut that down. We gotta get more diplomatic or PP every day. So they're touching us a little bit more, which is good. Siberian Revolution. Oh wait, hold on. Oh! Well, there goes Novosibirsk. Goodbye. On to Tokyo. Hopefully we can do this. Even though, technically, we did send guys to... How about... Our people here. Mm, we'll see what happens. Even with one division, it could be pretty darn strong down here. After on to Tokyo, what are we going to do after that? I'm not really sure. No peace conference. Central European Council. Goodbye. If we can be fast enough, we can just go here to here, maybe. Oh, you gotta go in here first, huh? Uh, we'll just, if you like to read about this, goes right ahead. We're gonna go with the conservative option, so. Ultimately, someone's not gonna like it, but whatever. Oh, and we cut them off that way. Nice. There you go. We just cut off two more divisions. Nice. Good job, guys. Uh, just go ahead and take all these guys out up here. There you go. We don't wanna lose Madan, so. Stay in the course. Oh my gosh. Conversations from the street. Indonesia calls. The San Diego Convention Center was hosting a large, raucous MPP rally following the recent onset of the hostilities in Indonesia. Most like the rest of California, America's finest city simmered with anti Japanese sentiment. Now that an opportunity to strike back at their sworn nemesis has appeared, the simmer turned into a violent geyser sweeping San Diego citizenry in equal parts rage and euphoria. Let's get those slimy bad word dudes while they're down, shouted Jeffrey Calloway amidst a rabble-rousing crowd. The college student carried with him an old propaganda poster from World War II. Held high above his head, made indistinct from the force of unparaged arms around him, but he seemed to care little. Bomb them all, bomb them all, went the mantra he and the rally breathed out as one 
before they unleashed our pent-up energy onto downtown San Diego later that night. The mood in MCRS San Diego was contrastingly subdued. Grunts grumbled about, as grunts were wont, of course, but many were also wore ribbons and pins from South Africa, dusty, gorous South Africa. Needless to say, a good number of harbored little appetite for another adventure so soon after the last. Lance Corporal Timothy Cross both carried his opinions louder and more bluntly than his colleagues. We've already stuck our uh, little D's in the belt, said the Marine, and now look how swell that went for us. A couple 10,000 of our boys went back home on a flag and the Corps thought and Corps thoughts and prayers. Now they're sending us to some malaria infested jungle in the middle of nowhere. Pay better be better than at least. Like its infamous volcanoes, Indonesia has erupted into the worst fighting the peninsula has seen since the Second World War. The free world clamors for an intervention into the rising sun's soft underbelly to loosen the empire's hold over the East Indies oppressed. But South Africa remains fresh in the minds of many. Does America have the will to stomach one more war after another, they ask? We always stand up to tyranny. Update from New York. Mr. President, the secretary called. He just wanted me to tell you that the meeting with the English went very well. Their state, Secretary of State, or whatever they call him. Mr. Stevas got on pretty well with him and the other foreign ministers in New York. His delegation was warmly received by the other OFN members, and he was a pretty pretty friendly dude meeting overall. They talked a little bit about various issues and had gotten lunch together. Nothing really disastrous happened, and that was mostly a breeze. Or at least the meeting was. And what's important is that the Prime Minister Jellico is still interested in the OFN. I mean, that's no surprise. He was basically called Alkenluck's handpicked successor. He's got the same monarch as Canada, and he hates the Nazis just as much as the next guy. That's great news, and it's good his party's backing him up on that as well. Anyway, nothing else has really happened. Mostly just talking and improving relations with other members' nations. They're going to be good members of the organization, and we'll be lucky to have them. Especially if they can reunite the rest of the Isles. The special relationship is back on, staying the course. If you'd like to read about this, this happened last time when I, uh shows a conservative nominee, but we need to strategically have a conservative nominee here, so. At least these guys like us a little bit more. Nice. Get rid of these folks. These gosh darn evil, evil folks. Thank you very much. Oh, let's make sure these guys get the things they need the most. Nice. 0.66 every day. Not bad. Um, I'm not sure where they're headed to, but what if we were to encircle them? A little bit of lag, something going on. Oh, we're getting actually touched here. We're going to encircle them and go back home. On to Tokyo, my friends. On to Tokyo. And actually, we don't mind doing... Is there the Indonesian focus tree as well? Uh, no, this is a union... Oh, there it is. The burning jungle. Picking up the red phone. Okay, cool. The burning jungle. Indonesia's aflame. What is their situation? Followed up with, pick up the red phone. Given that both of us are nuclear powers, it stands to reason that we must tread carefully when interfering with the co-prosperity sphere. While Japan seems to be controlled by level-headed men, we must be still be careful to toe the fine line between isolationism and being mavericks. We will place a call to the Japanese on the red telephone. We will assure them that we have no interest in sending Japanese boys home with American bullets in them yet. Our commitment to d democratic movements around the world brings us a moral obligation to support those who fight for freedom in Indonesia. Reminding them of Indonesia's technical independence and sovereignty, we, we will caution them against launching an intervention into the East Indies and remind them that threatening the freedom of a sovereign people may have dire consequences. If you're a little more unified, oh, I hope so. I really, really do. Move on in, thank you. Take that out so they can't move. Take them out. Oh, go up there, please. Thank you. Good. Keep them in peace. Two divisions are going to die here. Make that three. And we beat them up a few different times. Great, great to me. Oh, yep. Cool. Indonesia flame. Our analysis predictions regarding the East Indies have proven frightfully accurate. Sukarno's attempt at using, using martial law to solve the crisis with the PKI has been a dismal failure after years of frustration with his despotic administration. Liberal Democrat Mohamed Hatt has risen up against the Sukarno against, of the banner of free Indonesia. While Sukarno may stress that everything is under control, Hatt is moving swiftly to seize the country, having already taken large swaths of Ake, Bolneo, and Papua. This could be a critical opportunity for the U.S. to gain a new ally against Japanese domination of Asia as long as we act quickly. The treaty port negotiations, oh boy, this is going to go okay and probably terribly, but that's alright. Because these negotiations negotiations can be very extremely fickle. The assembled cabinet was silent, discussing or digesting the contents of the proposal before them. President Wallace surveyed the room, knowing the enormity of the movement was giving everyone pause. It's been 20 years since the end of the war, gentlemen, President Wallace said. A decade or so since Eisenhower tore up the Akagi Accords and admitted Hawaii into the Union. Now it's our turn to finish 
what he started. The proposal to send up to Japan at last and demand negotiations over the Treaty of Ports of San Francisco and L.A. would be the most ambitious and consequential diplomatic initiative by the U.S. in their lifetimes. The eyes of the world and of the American electorate would be scrutinizing them under a microscope. There would be no room for failure. The Japanese simply wouldn't fall, but it was clear that holding ports halfway across the world, a diplomatic nightmare and impossible to secure, was increasingly unattractive. How much could America push without being pushed aside by Japan in return? It would take the political power of the American government to ensure the successful return of the ports without giving away the house to the Japanese in the process, but a few concessions here and there might be useful in making demands further down the line. Let's make history, gentlemen. Cool. Alright, so we got a lot of guys here. They're suffering from attrition, which is nice. Um, I'm waiting for these guys to move up a little bit so they can take more territory. So then we can strike them when they have fewer divisions and we're done with this stuff. Awesome. Let's grab some of this. Military Construction 3, shall we? America wins the issue. Following weeks of intense negotiations between American, Japanese, and Italian officials in Rome, we have received word that the Italian government is receptive to the American proposal at hand and will align themselves closer to the U.S. on the current issue. In D.C., State Department diplomats breathe a sigh of relief as Italy draws one step closer to the oil fan in the free world, while their counterparts of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Tokyo curse under the breath of the setback. In Rome, government ministers solemnly nod for themselves, knowing that their decision will play a pivotal role in deciding the future of the Italian Empire for generations to come. The battle for Italy continues as the oil fan and co-prosperity sphere await the next summons from Rome to discuss the next item on their agenda. Full liberty and justice, hopefully for all. Nice. Now this guy spread out the Japanese proposed a summit location. Hawaii, uh, President George Wallace nearly choked on the morning coffee. Why do you have to go to Japanese Hawaii to negotiate for American territory? It's ridiculous giving them the home field advantage like that. It's just a starting pitch. The Japanese are playing hardball, seeing that what, would they, what they can get away with. The Secretary of State picked up the community key from Japan that President had discarded. Though I'm sure that if we decide to take the offer, our diplomats can spend more time preparing for the actual summit. Give me that, President Wall said, rereading the community key again. If the Japanese want to play hardball, then we can have the gosh darn summit on one of our own carriers this time. If we gave away the ports on Akagi, then we'll have them back on the Enterprise. The voters will love it. What do we get from riling up the Japanese like this? The Secretary of State sighed. If you're worried about what voters are going to think, why don't we propose Mexico City? We will lose political power, thus investing more. Um, that probably sounds like the best. I did that one last time, I think, so. And also, if it goes poorly for us, then I'm just going to go ahead and, like, make sure that it goes okay for us, so. Because we don't want to have an unsuccessful George Wallace campaign. Oh, look at this. The birth of the W, the Soviet Union inside? It might just be. Nice. I knew this would happen. Uh, I'd love to cut these guys down, so I'll do that, maybe, and then go there, maybe. Yes. Summon to set. The Japanese just entered their agreement on the location. We're good to go for the summit. A momentary look of relief emerged on the Secretary of State's face before swiftly disappearing. Now comes the hard part, President George Wallace said. We better get ready for what the Japanese are going to want in exchange for giving our territory back. They want our oil. They want access to our markets. The Secretary of State slid a folder on the over the President's desk. With everything that's been going on in the sphere, I can't hardly blame them. President Wallace smiled, and that gives us leverage. Making history one step at a time. Kill them enemy Marines, and we've done a glorious job. Japanese demand oil. Mr. Presidente, we've started negotiations with the Empire of Japan about the potential reacquisition of California ports. One big problem between our nation and the co-prosperity sphere is the fact that we do not trade enough. Because of this, the Japanese have demanded substantial amounts of oil to make up for the recent shortages. Simply put, the sphere lacks many of the oil reserves that we have here in the U.S. Luckily, the Japanese diplomats have seemed pretty desperate to sign a contract with us if we grant them subsidized oil purchases. The economy of the sphere will continue functioning. We may regain our lost ports. If we help the Japanese and the sphere helps us out. If we help out them, they help us out. We can see a brighter relationship between our two great nations. We also have a chance of bringing American workers back to work for us. Now, the question of the moment is, how much oil will we give to the Empire of Japan? We could be generous and offer them the substantial amounts of oil they, that they need. We could go down the middle and offer them a moderate amount of oil, and finally we could give them a small amount of oil, but they may not accept the offer. We also need to consider what the Japanese plan to use oil for. What do you say, Mr. President? We're going to give them as much oil as they want. You can have all the oil. Nice. Nah, so go. Oh, that's really nice. Uh, I'm going to do some more medium investments. Yeah. Uh, actually, land auction. I'm going to go medium. I don't care what happens. 1v1 with their support. We do pretty darn well. Japanese, US, or US Japanese stocks begin. Nice. Class 2 Senate election season. If you'd like to read about this, please go right ahead. But fighting for you and me, we're going to help elect the NPP because we want Hawaii. Man, oh man. Oof. Hey, we actually linked up here. Nice. A complete success. A trade deal between the U.S. and the Empire of Japan is finally being finalized after days of proposal. 
and communication. It seems like both parties are getting the resources they really need. The U.S. will have its ports in San Francisco and L.A. return without conflict, and the Empire of Japan will be given an oil grant that will help us solve the widespread shortage throughout the sphere. The President and Prime Minister of the U.S. and Japan, respectively, shook hands on the deal just moments ago. No matter what, both parties hope that these negotiations will better relations between us, or at least the two global superpowers. Workers both in California and the Japanese home islands rejoice as the nations announced the completion of the deal. Though the trade deal was completed, the diplomats in the U.S. and Japan still have work to do. Talks are supposed to carry on in the next few days, but one thing is for sure. There will be a peaceful end to these important negotiations. So, negotiations worked, but we ain't done yet. No, no, sir. Nice. Pick up the red phone. Now, mandatory naval training. Ready the Australians. Eh, that doesn't really help us out much. Oh, Navy on alert. Raise domestic support for the war. NPP support for the war. That is okay. Nothing here really helps us out that much. Lower domestic support does not sound really good. Maximum pressure does not help us. Propaganda leaflets does not help us. Block the aid of the Japanese do not help us. That's really weird. Minus 1.4 units of American improved infantry rifles, huh? Freedom fighters is not bad. Everything must go. Doesn't help us. Patriot division. Yeah, none of this helps us at all. So, doing this, like I've read from a guide, does not do anything for us at all. So, let's start the tree. First Indonesian focuses. Give all the oil to Japan. we got to go with the conservative uh, uh, Supreme Court justice. Now... Once this is done, we eventually need, of course, do. This is not, this is a union, not an empire. So no more interference on Washington and welfare. The beacon of democracy, freedom, and business. Not bad. So we could continue doing like fire of the people, community action, to encourage productivity among our citizenry. Brothers in arms. That's not bad. Investing in our allies would not be bad. It grows a little more unified would be pretty good as well. Uh, you know what? We'll do brothers in arms. The U.S., like any true sons of liberty, does not stand alone in bringing freedom and prosperity to the world, besides the many exiled governments operating in D.C. and Ottawa. We have allies both in the Atlantic and Pacific, not to mention our friends in Canada and our loyal minion... <clears throat> strategic partners in the Americas. However, our many friends and allies struggle greatly with equipment and manpower needs as they were heavily reliant on designs, technology, and productive capacity from a now fallen European continent. If they are to work in concert with the mighty U.S. armed forces as anything more than cannon fodder, we must help them stay at our level in terms of equipment and training. Now, we, got, we can't forget... We got this stuff to do as well. Significantly decreases Italian independence. Um, formula East of Suez oriented contingency plans. Encourage West Point Rosso Maniro exchange. Yeah, even more of us for us. Cool. And oh, well, we actually do stuff to Indonesia. Lower domestic support. I'm not doing that. Nope. Nope. We gotta win this war quickly. Rally domestic support. It also raise domestic war support. So, uh, the R&D support for the war is middling. So, not bad. Political landscape. Well, let's see. S -s oh, New England. Toss-up. Safe. Safe. Toss-up. 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 So, we might want to do the East Coast. The Deep South. I love the Deep South. Oh, yeah. Look at that. NPP. Upper South. It's not bad. Not bad. The Southwest is going to be a big old problem for us, though. Um, the Rockies aren't very good for us, either. Wyoming really likes us, though. Safe NP. Oregon? Wait, why is it West Coast? Where's California? California, Great Lakes Southwest, Upper South, Deep South, East. I guess is um, California not voting in this one? Or Washington? For the Senate? Okay, I guess it makes sense. Uh, yeah, just because. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Just because senators are elected every six years, which is a good thing and a bad thing at the same time. But not, nothing about my personal politics here. Anyways. Um, say, oh, we'll probably do East Coast. No, we'll do New England. Definitely do New England. Very good. Okay, so Honolulu Accords. We've invested minus 50 political power. Cool. Japan is currently in the lead. Well, we'll see about that. All right, we got to break these guys. So come down here and do this and do that. Actually, get down there first. Actually, no. Come over here and do this. Cut them all off. Nice. An end to the embargo, the Japanese representatives have laid down their terms to restart trade between our respective spheres of influence. They have suggested a mutual end to the embargo with no conditions on the trade to follow. Our negotiators are asking for what our response should be. Our industry advisors are asking us to accept immediately. Access to the vast markets in Japan, China, and India, and raw materials from the rest of the sphere is too big a prize to risk by adding clauses and conditions to the treaty. Some of our more hawkish negotiators, however, suggest we should push for more. Let's say conditions of trade in the sphere are set up to favor Japan, and we should ensure a deal that puts us on a more equal footing. To accomplish this, they suggest that we attach clauses on mutual tariff reduction to the treaty applied in the areas most beneficial of us, of course. We get more political power? Um, I think it's that if we lose political power, it's better. So, let's take a look down here. We have invested minus 25. There we go. America's currently in the lead, so that's what we want to see. 
Nice. Get down here and go out there. And those guys died. All right, time to get rid of these guys too. Nice. It's actually good to keep this one open, so no one's in the lead now, so that's okay. Please don't tell me that they gave up on an offer of return. The Japanese negotiators have responded to our demands for tariff reductions to accompany an end of the embargo. The response is not what we hope. Labeling our suggestions a naked graph for favorable conditions, they have rejected them out of hand and restated their previous officer. A mutual end of the trade embargoes and a resumption of trade on existing terms. Our choice now is accepting the best we can get or move on with the negotiations without an agreement on the matter. No deal? We'll take what we can get. Which means we invested more, right? Good, we have invested more. Good, good, good. These guys are running, they're all going to die. Which frees up more free Indonesian soldiers around here. And we need to get to Jakarta quickly, so. All smiles all around. It appears an end is in sight for the trade embargo between the world's greatest economies. Lead negotiators from the ongoing summit between Japan and the USA has made an announcement this morning that a deal will be resuming trade between their countries, which has been agreed in principle to be signed later today. On both sides of the Pacific, great hopes are being placed on economic benefits of the deal, and businesses are scrambling to take advantage of the new goods and markets on offer. It seems the world is one step closer to a thawing in relations between the US and Japan. Thank goodness. Anything else here? Uh, I'm kind of not interested in helping IBR right now. We got bigger things to deal with, so. However, I'm more... Oh, man. Election seasons. Oof. Oh, yeah. We don't have any more political power, which really sucks. But it's more... I'm more concerned about getting Hawaii back than anything else, I'll be honest. So, the third clause. It's time to move on to the third and last issue, the treaty ports. It's obvious to everyone that no real approachment uh, between our nations is possible while the Japanese occupy part of American mainland with all those threats that imply, and the Japanese have indicated their willingness to return the ports. The specifics of the transfer has been left to the cause or to the end of the negotiations, and this will be the last clause up for discussion. We have a few options about for how we we'll position ourselves to approach these final negotiations. Our advisors fear that a straightforward transfer will be perceived in Japan as a loss of face, and the politics of that perception might jeopardize a negotiation. So let's avoid this. They say we should offer to demilitarize the ports under pawn transfer. By doing so, we will ensure the Japanese have something they can point to as getting something in return, enabling them to transfer the ports without appearing weak. Others in our administration counsel a tougher approach. The goal of the whole summit, they say, is to turn a page on relations with Japan, and that can only be accompanied or accomplished if they agree not only to the port transfer, but to demilitarize Hawaii. With the Hawaiian missile crisis in all too recent memory, they claim that asymmetry of mutual threat will soon cause the rise in tensions back to the previous levels as long as the Japanese garrison land uh, garrison the island chain. Our most hawkish counsel suggests that we can demand the demilitarization of Hawaii without offering to demilitarize the ports in turn. According to them, it's only the solution the man in the street will accept, and that's the only way to prevent future resentment from souring relations. What approach should we take? So here's important. So the last time I played with RFK or the United States NPP is no matter what you choose, so there's a certain choice we want to make here. Do you know that demilitarization is a small price to pay? Free ports and demilitarized islands? The Japanese must demilitarize Hawaii before we receive our ports. Um, no matter what you choose, it can still fail. So, that's why I'll see you in just a little bit. And so, I've saved the game, and just in case. So, unilateral demilitarization is a small price to pay for our ports. Free ports and demilitarized islands will secure relations. And the Japanese must demilitarize Hawaii before we receive our ports. Must demilitarize free ports? Cool. We're going to go all the way, my friends. All the way and see what their response is. Even though, now we have no political power to get involved in... Uh, in Italy, which hopefully they too don't have anything as well. So, man, there's so many things going on right now. Oh, we don't need to see this one. Uh, we don't need to see this one either. So, but even this one, like, oh my goodness, so much. America's currently in the lead. You bet your butt we are. Uh oh, minus 50. What's going to, what is that going to do? What is that going to do? Well, it doesn't matter because we want to kill off enemy divisions anyway. So, ah, oh, feels so good. Agreement reached. After several long days and not spent in negotiations or delegations, they're delighted to inform us that they've reached a comprehensive agreement with their Japanese counterparts. As a toast to our success, our brightest policy experts are poring over the proposed clause, perfecting wording, and ensuring consistency between the English and Japanese translation. Soon, it'll be time to sign, and not long after, we hope we'll finally have our territory back. Our success on this clause bodes well for the outcome of the whole summit, one step closer to a comprehensive treaty. Which, is that the right thing to do? I think it was. Yeah. We have invested more. Cool. Okay, we've actually done really, really well here. Really, really well. I hope I chose the right one. Alright, down under. We wanted to do that stuff and help them out. Let's see. Uh, let's see. I'm looking at my guide right now. I need to re re look at that. So, how about no more interference? Yeah, why not? Throughout the years... 
it's of dominance, a disgusting political chimera that is the RD party had increasingly fr infracted on the foundations of this union with its federalist politics, chief among them the shameful Civil Rights Act. The opponents, while opponents will decry President Wallace as some ridiculous, frothing racist, his real agenda is simply protecting the average American from any more government infringement upon his freedoms uh, and something any reasonable person will agree with. And yes, that does include the freedom to keep away or keep the inferior races away. <sighs> hey, man. Everyone has their own opinions, I guess. Arsenal Democracy. We're pleased to punch with our new ally, Scotland. Their army is one of the best in Britain, and their defensive position is practically unparalleled. Their one problem is their limited resources. Scotland is small and never built up the same kind of population that England had. They have made up for this with their British army training and equipment, but the equipment is getting old and the trainers are even older. They need to update it for the modern era, a factor that the Scottish government has clearly acknowledged. They send a request for American assistance in upgrading their arsenal, providing military research from our vast library, and creating a shared training scheme with the American troops stationed in Scotland. Further, cooperation with the Scottish can only help with the eventual liberation of Europe. The fruits of our research should be shared with all the nations of the free world. As always, the only limiting factor is cash. Sure, why not? Brothers in Arms. The office of the president could be a thankless job, but there were still some simple tasks to be found here and there. For example, playing host. President George Wallace beckoned the leaders of the OFN to a side in the Oval Office as a pose for a group photo, smiling before the flash and clad to the cameras. It was a family photo for the free world, from Canada to Central America to Australia and New Zealand. All smiles and merriment before the press were shoot out of the room for the real work to begin. Often, the president would have to serve as mediator. President George Wallace found himself motioning for the Canadian Prime Minister to stop talking over his Central American counterpart so that his complaints would get a fair hearing. The leader of the free world would ensure that the the littlest among them was still among equals. But the easiest job President George Wallace found was that of salesman. Tens of millions of dollars in technical assistance for Latin American agriculture, hundreds of millions of dollars for the Canadian industry, or the never-ending reinforcement of Fortress Australia and the Rock of New Zealand. The precise sums President George Wallace realized never really mattered. It was that time of the year as important to OFN members as Christmas was to children. America would be generous to its OFN family. President George Wallace thought for they could either stand together or they would die alone. Uncle Sam has a present for you, and that's a lot more bombs in Indonesia. Nice. I just hope that we can get the ports back. Actually, let's take a look. Well, they still have Hawaii, but, you know. And they still have the ports. So, we'll see what happens. See what happens. Cool. I'm going to wait. Because our guys are looking pretty weak. The port, treaty ports are turned. The announcement of a comprehensive treaty between the USA and Japan has been greeted with optimism in most of the country. Throughout the last week, as speeches were held and papers signed, the promise of more peaceful future seemed at last a reality, and a profound sigh of release has passed through the nation. A tension that has been finally felt by our people for over 20 years has finally been loosening it, its grip. Today, as the treaty ports of L.A. and San Francisco passed back to the American hands, the atmosphere shifted to one of celebration. All across the country, everyday life has given way to port parties, pulling whole neighborhoods out of into the streets in celebration. The biggest crowds have all been seen in the treaty ports themselves. In San Fran, cheers from the gathered throngs drowned out the voices of the Japanese ambassador and his translator as the last Japanese flag was taken down and the stars and stripes hoisted in its place. Surprise was evident among the Japanese as well as the sailors boarded Chim. Chikuma found themselves cheered goodbye by the jubilant crowds of scowls and jeers they'd come to expect from Americans and replaced by cheerful smiles and waves. Pictures of the uniformed Japanese smiling and waving back to the crowds are now making the rounds on TV on both sides of the Pacific. Truly feels like a page has been turned on the U.S.-Japanese relations. Nice. So, Hawaii Shoto becomes a demilitarized zone. Alright, which is not great, but you know what? I might actually try to fix that. Maybe we'll try to fix that, should we? Uh, let's see what happens. Uh, do we get the ports back? Oh, we got the ports back. Um, hmm. Let me try something real quick. My apologies about that, but one more proposition. Our success in the port transfer negotiations, when the ease with which we reach an agreement has led to a remarkably friendlier tone at the summit, our delegations remarked on a surprising willingness on the side of the Japanese to discuss territorial revision and find a compromise in the East Pacific together. This provides us with an opportunity too good to pass up. With most of the treaties safely agreed upon, it's time to open discussion on one last question, the return of Hawaii. In order to give them to even consider the transfer, we must believe or be prepared to give important concessions in return. Our advisors believe that they might ask for a uh, a joint or neutral administration of the Panama Canal. Extensive arms limitation concessions are both. Regardless, it might be a price we should be willing to pay. Securing Hawaii would be a fantastic achievement for our government and for the USA, but beyond that, it would cement this treaty as the end of the era of hostility between us and the Japanese. The last core U.S. territory still occupied by Japan. Its return will mark a true end of the war in the minds of the public and help us usher a time of peace in the East Pacific. Submit the proposal as we are actually... I reloaded the game, like I said earlier, and we've actually came all the way down here, and we're going to get these guys over here. 
The RD's running a respectable campaign. A solid MPP campaign. Not bad, not bad. Get over here, get over here. Get everything you possibly can and kill them all off. Join air operations. And I think we're now done for their air doctrine. Nice. Actually, just come down here and help them out, out for now. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, boy. We definitely need more tactical bombers. I think, we'll, I think I'm making... We're making casts, I think. So, yeah, we're doing all that stuff. Nice. We're getting resources, so we're looking pretty good right here. It is 65, so we've got some helicopter stuff. We could do... Proof attack, Kelly's. Eh. Get some advanced drop tanks out, shall we? Nice. Oh, no. You're gonna die. Never mind. You all died there. Nice! We got free Indonesia, too! North Bodhi Administration. Well, so much for Baba Masao. Round two. Not days after the riotous celebrations in L.A. and San Francisco, the foreign minister returned to D.C. under President Wallace's personal invitation. The visit's official tent was a tour around the American capital, a show of goodwill capitalizing on the momentum of the now-named Handover's success. Unofficially, well, the old man had his suspicions. He thought them confirmed when he entered the Oval Office and saw the president turn back, or back turn, inspecting a large canvas next to the map of Hawaii. The minister drew in a sharp breath as he took a seat, stealing himself for the last conversation he ever wished to confront in his career. I trust the accommodations are to your liking, President Wallace asked without glancing back. The foreign minister grunted in assent. Not exactly proper decorum, but he figured the silence meant that the president didn't really care. Good! Leather shoes clacked with polished linoleum as the president shuffled back to the resolute desk, pulling several folders out of his cabinet. He spread the stack across the surface like a dealer with a stack of cards. Each folder bore a proposal and read capital letters across a tab. We don't want to keep you from seeing the sides, so I'll keep this brief. We've done some ideas for our government's consideration. We'll discuss these more later during your day. As he quickly as he had arrived, the minister left the office, escorted by his assigned guide. When he eventually inspected the president's ideas in print form, he was drawn to... Measure negotiations over Hawaii's re-entry to the Union, exchanging the Panama Canal, Zone, Panama Canal Zone for Hawaii, unconditional retrocession of the Italian islands to its rightful government. Now, like I said earlier, things could fail, and that's why we do fade and fade out all the time. So if this fails, well, we'll fade and fade out. So, this is the one we want. Unconditional retrocession. Probably. Measure negotiations. Um, We can demand it, because right now, currently, what are we doing? Actually, oh, as you can see, I definitely reloaded the game, so let's close all this stuff up. There you go. Uh, we can close that too. We still need to keep that one open, so let's try it. Would you like that political power, Japan? Come on. Mohammed Hatta's National Front wins Indonesian Civil War. Nice. Actually, let's take a look here. Unique focus tree? No focus tree. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Invested 25. America wins the issue. Following the weeks of intense negotiations between American, Japanese, Italian officials in Rome. Oh, I thought this was talking about uh, <laughs> the Hawaiian thing. So, for liberty and justice, nice. We win the next issue as well. Uh, so, for this one, where do we want to go with? NPP, 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 toss up. NPP, Michigan, uh, RD. To towards NPP, NPP, NPP. Either the East Coast or New England. So, we could probably do East Coast then. There we go. Come on, Japan, come on! Regarding DMZ violations. The next, the next obstacle the conference would hurdle was how violations should be addressed. The Japanese delegation emphasized that all parties should be bound by the agreement's terms, ensuing or ensuring such requirements appropriate or each requires appropriate retribution in the event that either party, irrespective of reasons, fails to uphold said terms. Laws are toothless without punishment, said the Japanese foreign minister, and only sharp teeth suffice for treaties between two nations that can end the world with a bu button press. Our ambassadors were split on the issue on one hand, clearly defined punishments for violations within the proposal proposed DMZs disincentivizes Japan from using them as a de facto outpost for their Pacific-wide cordon sanitaire, provided, of course, that the same penalties apply to them. Those disinclined to trust the Empire's intentions argue that the punishments will be selectively and aggressively applied at their disfavor. Additionally, a minority opined stringent punishments will prevent us from justifying certain activities through creative interpretation of the agreement's terms. Future administrations may find themselves in an option short should the need for actions of the DMZs arise. In the end, American delegation approved disciplinary measures for violating the agreement. Failed to reach it. Ooh, we didn't want to fail to reach a compromise. Um, actually, we might want to do that, but you know what? That's okay for now. Cool. 25, 100. Let's see what the J Japanese propose. No more interference. Cool. 
and we probably want to go ahead and do maybe a little bit about American business, so the beacon of democracy, freedom, and business. America is the last great nation on earth to preserve the ideals of freedom and democratic government. We owe our success in this regard of the mightiest economy mankind has ever assembled, forged and maintained by American banks and American industries, free from the state's menacing grip. They had risen to great heights, earning greater profits year after year until soon America surpassed and utterly dwarfed the old world tyrants and their many inefficiencies. It cannot be said enough, without its unflinching dedication to free markets and free enterprise, our nation will be consigned, or have been consigned, to a footnote in the annals of history long ago. A new president, or as a new president enters the White House, so too must America chart a new course for its economy. For thinking men such as you and I, there exists only one option, promote American business, at home and abroad, whatever the cost. Only then, as American dollars and American businessmen travel from Washington to all four corners of the earth, unimpeded, unburdened, will our nation be capable of continuing the fight for the ideals we so deeply cherish in the decades to come. Which was one of the comments from yesterday, which I'm finally addressing at an hour and 25 in here. Um, yeah, go for the economic street to get more popular support for, for Wallace. So that's this is why I've taken, taken so long to do this. On Washington and welfare. Hundreds, if not thousands, are gathered ahead of the White House steps to witness a speech prepared by President George C. Wallace. Some gathered to clap, yell, and applaud the former Alabama governor. Some had gone to march against the president's expected speech, and some, well, they gathered to enjoy the spectacle that would be the speech on the situation in America today, as explained by the president. Finally, President Wallace stepping up to the podium with a face ranging from confident at best to uncomfortable at worst. My dear Americans, I welcome you to the Capitol on this cold afternoon to remind you of your president's duty. Duty, as I've said before, is a word bathed in subtlety. And it means its meaning undermined by the likes of those wishing to undo the greatness of our nation in the name. In their ambition. As we stated time and time again, our good country remains ridden with this plague as its symptoms continue to rise. The president said, as some in the crowd braced for what they knew was coming next, Yes, this is evident in the lack of options toward segregation of the school system and workplace. However, beyond this, our nation has seen these issues rise in the healthcare system as the sick, injured, and handicapped of our nation suffer at the hands of the icy grip of federal intervention. Manipulative bureaucracy seeks to twist and turn the path to heal, while the top minds of American businesses, businesses seek to create a new, fair, and economically sustainable option for the citizens of the future. Moreover, we see a continuous trend of declining local power at the hands of the lowly heads of power here in D.C., reaching all the way to the American economy as more and more restrictions are constructed to prevent the people of the U.S. from succeeding in their freedom. My administration will do all it takes to work above and beyond the federal paperwork committed by years of unmoving, uncaring political manipulation. To support the states, to support the workplace, to support the schools, to support you, the President remarked. After years of backlash and anger from the American populace, President Wallace was finally able to hear a noise which invoked a sense of beauty in his mind. Silence. Followed by widespread applause with only a small crowd to protest. Marching on in the American battleground, we go popularity grows a little bit more and get more political power, which we could really, really use for right now. Come on, Japan, come on. Treat spying on the ports. We have high unity. The sun withdraws. Well, the handover sparked hope that the brinkmanship that nearly ended the world will, be un will end unlike the way it began. Relations between the Japanese Empire and the U.S. were warmer than they'd ever had been in decades. So much so that the proposals to share the world's largest ocean between them were openly advanced, rather than dismissed without hesitance. As the two superpowers met again to discuss exactly that, many thought they would see the Pacific question settled within their lifetimes. Such fantasies were dispelled by Japanese diplomats, leaving the conference disgruntled and without the promised settlement. Or settlement. Perhaps none could fault Tokyo for protecting its hard-won conquests from America's encroachments, or simply for barring them from taking 2,000 miles more when they already won their inch. Yet not, had not the rising sun scorched the forest under those shades the eagles once rested, to see its lost glades return, and the Americans replied, is no unreasonable ambition. That Tokyo argued otherwise, said more about the Empire's bad faith and the conference which masked it with a pretense of compromise than their own. But did right and wrong matter to the millions who longed for peace that stayed, rather than a conflict kept frozen until it can't? Well, that's why we fade in and fade out. Alright everyone, so we haven't quite got back to Hawaii yet, but I gotta explore this just a little bit more because there's no real clear way for us to be able to get back Hawaii without giving up the, Pinal, uh, the Panama Canal Zone, so I apologize, but I've gotta end it here because this video's gone on long enough. So, tomorrow we will resume, or in the next episode we will resume, in which we will hopefully get Hawaii back, no promises, but it's kind of really odd and trying to get Hawaii anyways, but anyways. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow, as hopefully we can pursue more negotiations with the Japanese. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day.